Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and this is part 2 of the tutorial that I'm making for you guys and I'd like to thank you for watching the previous part if you did, if you didn't I will link it down below and add a little tile card right here that you, so that you can check it out and in this tutorial I'm just taking you through the basic steps of a traditional drawing that I do using ink and watercolor. So I'm just gonna jump right into the next step, which is the lighting pass on the line work. For the lighting pass, I usually pre-mix three different shades of ink. I have one that's non-diluted, so fully brown in this case, maybe a little bit darker if I want it to be so. I think I think I just used brown without adding any black in it in this particular illustration. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, it was the Van Dyke brown by the Dr. PH Martin brand. And I will also use the around like 50% or so diluted with water and I will usually do one more that's a lot lighter so I will usually start the process with the lightest tone and I'll start with the character specifically the face I will recommend to really go easy and careful on this step because it's very <laughs> it's it's too too easy to ruin the drawing which i have personally done uh i do kind of like the excitement of something being very easy to ruin it kind of adds something to me i, I guess i don't know it's a little bit of a thrill if it can be thrilling sitting around for hours on end in your room at your desk but anyways um yeah, I just do a light shadow pass. Uh, I usually have the lighting predetermined in my head, or at least I have some sort of an idea of what the lighting will be. In the case of this particular drawing, it's relatively simple. So I didn't need to use a reference for the lighting, but if you have trouble with this, or if you're not particularly experienced with putting down shadows and stuff, I would recommend finding a reference, at least for the face, to just make your life a little bit easier. But yeah, um, this step is quite tricky. I use ink for shading uh, mostly because it's permanent and it doesn't revive with water. Like I talked in the previous part of this tutorial, I mentioned the fact that I kind of migrated sort of a Photoshop approach to into my traditional drawings uh, because I do tend to bounce back and forth between the two. So the reason why I like to use ink for shading is because, of course, it's permanent and I, it, it cannot be revived with water, so I can easily put the color down afterwards and enhance the shadows if I need with color. But it, it kind of, I guess it reminds me of the approach that a lot of painters have uh, with Photoshop, like digital painters, where they will do a grayscale and then they'll just do like a color... Um, they'll do colors on another layer on top and set it to like a different blending mode so this is something like that and i do think it's kind of a unique approach i can't say that i've seen other watercolor artists do this maybe maybe some people do it i don't know but it's something i started doing a few years ago and it's been working great for me i also like it because it's very concise and it it seriously keeps me in um like uh it basically makes the steps very clear. So if you have the shadows and lighting as a as its own step, then from start to finish you do the lighting and it is done. Whereas if you do the shadows with color, uh, obviously the result is quite different. But for me personally, it adds a little too many variables in the process and it may be a little bit confusing to me because I, I like a very straightforward process. So trying to shade and color like at the same time kind of is a little bit too much. I don't usually do that. So this process works very well for me. So yeah, after I finished putting down the basic lighting on the figure, I decided to go in and fill the background shape, like the, the framing shape, with ink. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I just wet the paper first and then go in dabbing the ink surrounding the hair and removing any excess ink to create something like a gradient effect. And then just having it go darker, so using more uh, undiluted ink 
towards the edges of the frame and then just carefully fill in all the de all the little um, empty spaces between the flowers at the bottom of the frame and yeah this this part is a little bit time consuming but as you can see it really added like a striking effect to the overall illustration which is a very good example of using a medium to its uh intended i guess unique to using a medium specifically for its strengths and its unique properties this type of effect is one of my favorite things about ink this is really, really difficult to create in Photoshop. I think the process can be definitely done and there's a lot of really great brushes out there that imitate this type of effect, but I think it's a lot more enjoyable to create it organically on your own and you will always have an interesting result. So yeah, uh, at this point, we're ready to move on to the next step. So the next step is the watercolors. It's time to bring the character to life by adding some color. So I mixed and tested all the colors on the scrap paper first. And depending on the type of watercolor that you use, this step can be quite tricky. It requires some serious precision in my case because um, the watercolors that I use are revived very easily by water, so I have to be very careful not to accidentally revive an adjacent color with the brush so that it'll bleed into the color that I'm using. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have any tips for that aside from just being very careful if you're using the same type of watercolors or letting it like really dry thoroughly. I think that might help also. I'm usually really impatient, so I can't be bothered to wait long periods of time in between the steps. So I just kind of roll with it and uh, hope for the best. But um, yeah, working bigger will also help a lot with this. Um, being precise when working on a small scale is more difficult, but yeah. At this point, thankfully, most of the work has already been done with the lighting and shadow pass. So this is a very, very simple step. And the biggest concern here is leaving out the whites of the paper for highlights. So I would just think about it a little bit and not rush too much and decide what uh, parts you want to leave out. So those will be your highlights and I will sometimes saturate the colors a little more to accentuate on shadows or something. <laughs> yeah, but most of the shadows have already hopefully been done. And sometimes at the end of the step, the drawing can still look a little bit unfinished and unpolished. So at that point, I move on to the next step, which is the finishing touches. So I like to leave the precise detailing to non-brush tools, such as colored pencils, pens, nibs, gel pens, whatever. I don't usually like to mix two different types of paint because that could easily get out of control. Like I used to sometimes uh, try using white gouache for the highlights where I missed any, but then I realized that sometimes the gouache will like weirdly mix with the watercolor and then it'll get a tint and I don't know it, it just becomes messy and sometimes since gouache is opaque it's easy to get out of control and be like oh well since I can paint on top of the ink maybe I'll add a little bit more detail here or there and then at the end you will have like a half gouache half watercolor piece so I would probably suggest sticking to one thing and maybe getting like a white gel pen or something for the details I don't 
use a white gel pen myself i like to just do my best to leave the highlights out when i paint and then sometimes even if there's tiny ones that are too difficult to leave out uh, i'll just leave that to photoshop honestly because i mean i i feel like the end result for me um, on paper is usually good enough so it looks fine as an original but obviously i like to enhance it a little bit when i scan it into photoshop but that will be the next step um, in this step where I add the finishing touches, I sometimes add gradients here and there using colored pencils. I didn't really do that too much in this drawing because I didn't feel like it needed any, but uh, sometimes I will just use like a red pencil or something to add a little bit more depth and add a little bit of something interesting into the piece. Like I said, in this one I didn't really do that, so it's redundant to mention I suppose, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I will also use uh, go back to uh, using a nib to add a little bit more detail, so like the eyeliner that you see on her face, like a little bit of makeup, the, the tiny lashes, just small details here and there can be added post color as well, going back to ink. And that's about it. I usually don't take too long on this step, um, it's important not to overwork the drawing and just call it done when it's done. And at this point, I'm ready to move on to the last step. And by the last step, I meant the last step on paper. <laughs> Obviously, there's one more step, uh, which is the scanning and cleaning up in Photoshop. But yeah, the last step here on paper is the washi tape border. I really like adding a washi tape border because it creates a really interesting effect. And in my opinion, it adds more value to the original artwork because th this is something that can't be replicated in a print or in Photoshop. It just makes the drawing more special. I do have, I do think that originals have a lot of value and I love looking back at them. Uh, so yeah, this is a highly optional step. It's kind of crafty, like I use um, an X-Acto knife and it can take a little bit of time to do this, it's pretty tedious, but I think it's worth it. So I just picked out a shimmering black washi tape and I cut it down to thin little strips and then I just kind of taped it around the edge of the frame. And when that's finished, it's time for the very last step, which is scanning the drawing in and cleaning it up in Photoshop. And fortunately, since I knew that I was going to make a tutorial out of this drawing, I actually recorded the screen of the cleanup of this drawing as well. So here we are, and here is the last step. So this last step is probably one of my favorites overall because I really, really enjoy going back and just polishing the finished artwork. So obviously the first step is to scan the drawing. The scanner that I use is the CanoScan LIDE35 model. It's quite old, so I don't think it's available on uh, in stores or online anymore. But there's obviously better ones that are later models available on Amazon. I checked <laughs> and they're around like $100, I think. They're not too expensive and this they obviously last a very long time. Like I've had this one for a while now and it still works perfectly fine. Don't get discouraged by the super shitty looking scan, which is always really pale and sad looking, but I think it's actually perfect the way that it scans because it just preserves all the essential information without making any corrections on its own behalf. So I would suggest scanning it at obviously a high resolution. I usually scan all my artwork in 600 dpi resolution. Um, and uh, I think I just use JPEG format. I don't know if PNG might be better, but JPEG is fine. And I would suggest not using any of the scanner settings that might want to brighten it or like uh, increase the contrast. So you want it looking pale because then you have full control in Photoshop over how you're going to edit it. So yeah, I would leave all the editing to Photoshop and not mess with any of the settings in the scanner. So yeah, once it's scanned, I bring it into Photoshop and the first thing I do, of course, is crop the image 
uh, down to the size that it's supposed to be because obviously it will scan past the drawing. It's pretty straightforward. So after I crop the drawing, I will fix the levels first. So I'll just bring up the um, the whites. And it, it will get rid of some of the uh, texture and like whatever dirt you might have on the paper and I'll also bring up the darks. I'll, I'll usually leave the midtones like the little knob kind of slides around um, when you move uh, move up the darks the, the midtones will move as well in balance with the darks. I don't know how to explain it but I'm not I'm no expert when it comes to Photoshop but I'm just letting you guys know the basic stuff that I do. Um, after I fix the contrast, I will usually correct the colors as well. I will do this using the control plus B, which is color balance. And I, I personally like to add red. It depends on the drawing because I, I tend to like, I, I tend to gravitate towards warmer colors usually in my artwork. So I will bump up the reds and like maybe the yellows sometimes. I think of this one, um, in this one, I bumped up the yellows a little bit. Uh, yeah. After I correct the colors and the contrast is when the fun part really begins. Um, I will sometimes go in with burn and dodge very gently to just darken some parts that didn't get quite dark enough with the levels. And of course I'll watch out for um, any sort of dirt or anything on the paper. So I'll obviously go and manually remove that. <laughs> Um, as you can see, I just like selected a bunch of, I just selected everything outside of the frame and then I cleaned it up completely so that there will be no weird unexpected dirt or little specks on the eventual print of this drawing. And yeah, at this point, once it's pretty much cleaned up, I go ahead and start polishing, which is my absolute favorite. My go-to brush in Photoshop for sketching and polishing traditionally scanned artwork is called Rough Pastel. I think it comes with Photoshop CC. So I will just bounce back and forth between the color picker tool and the Rough Pastel. And I'll just go in and smooth out all the lines, get rid of anything that bleeds outside the lines. These are, these are things that you can't really notice too well when you're looking at the original. But obviously, when I scan it at such high DPI, you can see all the little, I guess, you can't call these mistakes, but it's not as clean as I want it to be. I don't know if this is redundant or not, but here's here's the thing. I'm going to tell you guys something that you will probably not hear a lot of our artists say, but I like to work smaller and then blow up my artwork to print. This is pretty much unheard of because anybody who I've ever... Um, listen to talk about their traditional process and making prints they always say the opposite they always say you have to work bigger traditionally and then um, once you scan it in and make prints you just scale it down and that's when it looks best I know that this is obviously true but for me personally I have never done that and I've always done the opposite which is work a little bit smaller and then blow it up in uh, Photoshop and then make bigger prints. This tends to work for me precisely because of this little extra bit of work that I do which is the polishing. So I will just zoom in and just slowly correct and polish out any of the small details, especially around the focal area of the drawing, just to make it look more clean and neat. And that will honestly bring it up to bring it up a lot and make it a very clean print. It often looks even better when it's printed out way bigger than the original. I think this is because when I make the prints bigger, it really blows up like the texture aspect of the traditional drawing which is when you work small sometimes it's a little bit hard harder to see the uh, texture but when you blow it up it looks more vivid so i really like that effect personally and having polished all the little edges and gotten rid of all the specks of dust and stuff pretty much makes it impossible to determine how big the original drawing was so over the years this process has worked super well for me all it takes is like an extra like half an hour or less of polishing and you're not really doing anything it's uh, to me personally it's a very enjoyable step 
it's kind of like cleaning a messy desk you know what i mean you just zoom in and like fix all the little lines and such so yeah and after i finished going around and just fixing the curves and polishing the lines i will move on to the face and this is the most fun part where i will just correct all the little things and add the tiny little highlights that i've been looking forward to in the eyes and yeah i will frequently zoom out just to make sure that the drawing looks pretty much the same as it did before i started polishing it because especially back in the day like sometimes um when i started doing this process i would get too carried away with the polishing process and then sometimes the drawing will end up looking very different from the original um, painting on paper which is something i tend to avoid uh at this point but even then you know honestly if it works for you it works for you i like to keep it looking as similar to the original as possible to retain the same type of feel and so that the original doesn't lose value in my eyes either i don't want the digital like enhanced version to look too much better so yeah So after I finish polishing all the little things, I will sometimes add in like little specks of white, which add a very nice feel to it. And, you know, just like a little dabs of whatever might be missing compositionally. Like if an area looks like it's not detailed enough, I will maybe pop in a little, little flower here and there. As you can see in this drawing, I added some little white flowers to, um, kind of just enhance the frame and make it more interesting to look at. I really like the little white flowers and I think it added a lot to the picture even though they weren't there in the original and I added a little bit um, these little specks of white to kind of enhance the glowing effect around her hair uh, and yeah I guess at that point it's pretty much done. I will usually stare at it for a little bit, like, uh, I don't know, 20-30 seconds, see if there's anything else that I might have missed. And yeah, that's pretty much the entirety of my process, and it is quite a fast process, I think. Overall, it takes me maybe around like 3 or 4 hours for the entire thing, which is pretty quick in my opinion. Like, I can definitely do it in one day, and um, a lot of the time the scanning and polishing is an extra step that i do specifically for making prints so if you take away that optional step uh something like this uh depending on the degree of detailing that you want to pull in uh put in can take like about uh two two and a half hours or something so it's a very quick process and i think the fact that it's been so thoroughly split into steps has really helped me um with the speed and the efficiency is some one of my favorite parts of this uh, process, which is why I really wanted to share it with you guys. And I really, really hope that this uh, was helpful to you. And I hope you decide to try this approach for yourself. And please let me know what you think about it. And uh, let me know if you found my descriptions of each step helpful, if anything was confusing, or if you'd like me to elaborate or anything. And once again, thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. If you haven't already, please do. And I look forward to making more videos for you guys. I can't, pros uh, I can't promise making too many tutorials all the time because it, it is quite a bit of work. And obviously, YouTube is not a job for me. It's something I only do for fun. Um, but I am hoping to put more time into this channel and if at some point it becomes a significant source of income, I will definitely want to provide more educational content for you guys. But in the meantime, I will also make other videos like I have in the past. And of course, please take a look at my description below for any links to the materials that I use or anything that I mentioned, as well as a Skillshare class that I have available and my tutorials uh, on my Gumroad account. Thank you so much again for watching this video and I will see you in my next one. Bye!